We've been doing the series on the victory that we have in Christ, and this morning I want to speak about position. We have a certain position in Christ because of our faith in Him, because of Jesus' death and resurrection. We have a position that is bestowed upon us. And I just want to, by way of um, starting this message, I want to talk about the word position, which is a simple word, but it carries a lot of different meanings. It can mean, for instance, a place that you occupy. So I occupy a place called Eight Sunshine Place. That's my my address of abode. That's my position in our city, a place that you occupy. It can also mean a a position as in a sports team. So you play rugby, you play as the fullback, or you play as the halfback or a lock, or maybe you play another sport. There are positions that you fulfill, that people fulfill. A, a, a position can also be a point of view that you have. So there might be an issue going on in society and you take a certain position regarding that, that issue. You with me so far? So the, the word position can be applied in multiple ways. I'm going somewhere with this, you'll see very shortly. Uh, a, a position can be a post of employment. So you could carry a particular position at the ASB Bank, for instance. Uh, it's a, a post of employment. Um, A position can be, in military terms, it can mean an area or point occupied for tactical reasons. So uh, an an army takes up a particular position, or a a detachment take a particular position for tactical purposes. Uh, Position can also mean that you are in a position to do something or carry out a certain task. Because of your circumstances, you're in a position to help with that. Some of us here today are in a position to significantly help our India team get to India because of where we're at financially or the stage of life that we're in. Others may not be in quite the same position, but we're still in a position to do something. So so there's there's these different applications to the word position. Now, as believers in Jesus, we have a certain spiritual position in Christ. And I'm going to apply all these different meanings of the word position to our position in Christ, and you'll get to see how broad and, uh, and how varied this is. You see, in Ephesians 2 verse 6, it says that we are seated with Christ in in the heavenly realms. That's our position. That's our spiritual status, if you like. Sometimes we can feel like we're uh, kind of seated in the, you know, in the doldrums. But the Bible tells us, regardless of how you feel, because it's not about how you feel, it's just a fact. The fact is, is that when Jesus died on that cross and you put your faith in him, It actually puts you in a position called seated in the heavenly realms. It's a spiritual position that you that you that you have. It's not something that's necessarily a a, a natural thing. It's a spiritual thing. But let me tell you this: sometimes we have this idea that the spiritual is a bit ethereal and a bit sort of out there. You know, sometimes people say things like, "Oh, you know, you you always spiritualize stuff." Is this to say you always make it something that's unattainable? But the spiritual realm is actually more real than the physical realm. It actually has power over the physical realm. Depending on your spiritual state will very often determine the outcome of your physical, the, the, the way that you live your life in the physical. So, so let's not demean the spiritual. Let's elevate it the way it should be. And, uh, and we're talking here about this position that we carry in Christ. You see, because of Jesus' blood shed at Calvary, we have been bestowed with a heavenly citizenship. You've actually become a citizen of heaven. Now, you say, well, what does that mean? The fact that I'm a citizen of New Zealand gives me great advantages when I travel. Did you know that that New Zealanders are loved around the world? We're loved around the world. When we traveled up to India back in, when was it? The seal? 2014, was it? Man, that's a long time ago, isn't it? It's hard to believe. When we went up there, oh, you're from New Zealand. You're from New Zealand. And because they loved Pearl, because she was... An original New Zealander. That's that's what they said. So, oh, you are an original New Zealander. And they just, they didn't quite know what to make of Seal because he looked so much like they did. (laughs) But we were all Kiwis, you see. And we all had had New Zealand passports. Do you know citizenship really counts for something? Where you come from, look, I'll tell you, you're in the world, but you are a citizen of heaven. That has powerful spiritual ramifications. I wonder how many of us are actually walking in the reality of that. That's going to be the challenge of the message today. Are you walking in? How can you step out into more of the reality of the position that you've been bestowed, that's been bestowed upon you in Christ? 
In Philippians 3 verse 20, it literally says, but our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly await a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. This is powerful. Now, let's apply some of these definitions of the word position to the fact of our position in Christ. So it goes like this. We are spiritually situated or located in Christ in the heavenly realms. Do you know that in real estate terms, location is everything? How many remember that good old program, location, location, location? It's all about, you know, really, it's all about buying the worst house in the best street, you know, so that everybody else's houses around you kind of lift the value of your house. And, um, and so, but location is incredibly important. Now, when we think of it in spiritual terms, we live in the best street in town. You live in the best street in town. You're a heavenly citizen. Far out. Talk about location. Here's the next one. We occupy a certain area for tactical advantage. Your position in Christ gives you an advantage over the enemy, gives you an advantage over the devil and all of his schemes. This is called spiritual warfare. Now, in this position, we, have, we, we are above the enemy, out of range, and we are positioned to mount attack on him. See, if, you, if you're not really aware of or haven't had like a revelation of the position you have in Christ, you get around like he's over you. And you're worried about the devil. You're worried about his tactics and schemes and how can we ever, how can we ever wage war against, against the devil? But look, when you, when you understand who you are in Christ and the position you, you, you have, you begin to realize you're actually out of range. The Bible says, what can separate us from the love of Christ? Nothing, absolutely nothing. I'm sure the devil is involved in that nothing. It's not like, oh, that's right, we forgot about the devil. Oh, man, that's right. Oh, I need the, no, 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 you're out of range. Tactical advantage. In Romans 8 verse 7, it says, we are more than conquerors through Christ. What does that mean? It means that you, through Christ, are able to conquer everything the enemy throws at you. You actually can do this. You don't have to live your life worried about what's going to happen or what's going to take you out when you know the position you have in Christ. Amen? Amen. In Christ, we've been given the high ground above the enemy. The next thing is we have a certain point of view because of our position in Christ. A certain point of view in Christ that is very different from the world. It's about as different as that of an eagle from a chicken. How many know that an eagle has a very, very different perspective on the landscape and of, the, of the, the surrounding areas than a chicken does? When you're soaring at, I don't know how many thousand feet an, an eagle's able to soar on those, on those updrafts and currents, but their vantage point is vastly different from that of a chicken. And so is yours when it comes to the fact that you have a position in Christ. You see, when, when, you, when you give your life to Christ, your eyes get open to the eternal. Before that, you're just pretty much wrapped up in the temporal. Anything of regard the eternal, it, it's whether a person believes it or not, there's not, not a lot of knowledge about it. But when we start to understand the Word of God and, and we begin to get a revelation about, about eternity and all of that sort of thing, it's, it begins to give you an eagle perspective. Um, it's really interesting. I was um, uh, in a, in a, uh, went, went and visited a rest home last Monday. And I was um, talking with this elderly guy who was just sitting there by the door, and he just saw a new, va- a new face and thought, oh, well, you know, this, this is pretty cool, chat with someone different. And he said, he was 90 years old, this guy, and I'm 47. And he said to me, he said to me, wow, you're lucky, you're so young. <laughs> it was nice to be called young. <laughs> Our young people in church don't call me young. But anyway, go to a rest time if you want to be called young. That's a great way to go. Anyway, <laughs> so... Uh, But it got me thinking, I thought, you know, because I I sit down with my parents, and and they're elderly, and uh, and we start to talk about eternity. And uh, it's like they're not not coming to the close of their years, they're coming to the dawning. You know, this this gentleman I I was talking to, and I don't know, we didn't get into, you know, where he stood in his faith and everything, but if you just take it from from that, um, you know, just from that that point of view of, of, you know, you're lucky, you're young, and I'm, I'm old and my life's almost over, well then if you've just got a temporal view of life, that's a sorry state to be in. But when you have, when you're positioned in Christ, friends, it's just the beginning. I sometimes joke with my mum and dad because, you know, they're struggling with, particularly dad, struggling with physical ailments and things. I said, dad, do you realize you're going to be 25 again? 
you know, not too many years from now, because I just have this theory that when you're in heaven, because you're kind of, you know, 25, you're kind of in your prime, you know? And um, I don't think that when we die and go to heaven, we're going to be the age that we are when we died. You know, so you're just going to be forever 86, you know? <laughs> I, I just don't think that. I just think that um, the Lord gives us a new body, a new body that doesn't um, feel pain. It's never sad, never, never has to shed a tear of sadness ever again, only maybe tears of joy, unending joy, and youthfulness. And this goes on forever and ever and ever and ever. What are we going to be doing in 10 billion years' time? I don't know. But I know it's going to be good. I know it's going to be good. Now, for the person who's positioned in Christ, that is about to dawn when they're about to pass out of this life. So you have an entirely different viewpoint you have a different position on the state of affairs in this planet when you're positioned in Christ. Amen? Isn't this exciting? Don't you love this? Who's just enjoying being reminded of some of these things? <laughs> Had a few people after the first service saying, man, it was just so good to just be reminded of those things and get into all those scriptures, which we're about to get into in a moment. Okay, the next thing is, because of our position in Christ, we have been given a position of employment. You are duly employed in the kingdom of God. Now, sometimes people that are, are unemployed kind of feel like, oh, I'm, I'm an unemployed. In actual fact, if you're in Christ, you're not unemployed. You are, you, are employ, you are employed with an employment that actually is more important than earthly employment. See, because in Christ, we're supposed to seek first the kingdom of God. That means, that means your kingdom employment comes before your earthly employment. Sometimes some Christians live their lives like their, their earthly employment is more important. You know, their career and all that is more important, and they tack on a little bit of kingdom stuff as if it's a bit of a hobby. Can I tell you, it's got to be shifted around. It's got to be changed up. Your, your kingdom purpose is the primary thing. Now, it'll be if you're in a particular career or, or some form of employment, the Lord has designed it for you to serve the kingdom through that and in other ways as well, through church life, through various means. But the kingdom is to come first. You are duly employed if you, have a, if you are seated with Christ in the heavenly realms. Because of our, here's the final one, because of our position in Christ, we are in a position to do certain things and carry out certain tasks. Do you know that there are things to be done in this world that can only be done by someone who is seated in Christ in the heavenly realms? A person that's not seated with Christ can't lead someone else to Christ. A person, that's seated with, a person that's not seated with Christ can't minister the love and life of Jesus. You can. We had a, a group of guys, a really good group of guys out yesterday at Teamworks, and uh, just a little for Teamworks. Okay, joint, come on, guys, on the what was it, 15th, I said it, didn't I? The 15th of August for the Teamworks recruitment night. But we had a, a great Teamworks day yesterday. And these guys we, were just out there um, just serving in people's homes, people in the church here um, that, that need help with their lawns and trimming bushes and, and that sort of thing. And we're interacting with the neighbors as well. The neighbors know what's going on. They, they're aware that every month the team comes here and helps out and, and it's like amazing and they're from this person's church and it gives this person a great witness in their community as well. It's a pretty awesome thing. Look, what's happening is these guys are out there serving the kingdom. Sometimes we think of kingdom service as something that's undoable. No, 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 it's very doable. Jesus never, I said this a few weeks ago, but Jesus never asks you to do anything. He never asks you to do great works. He only asks you to do good works. And then he takes the good work and it makes it a great work. At the feeding of the 5,000, if you know the story, the little boy brought his lunch to Jesus. That was a good work, not a great work. It's not hard to give a lunch to somebody. Jesus took their lunch and turned it into a great work and fed 5,000 people supernaturally with it. So when you and I engage in kingdom, in kingdom endeavor, you're bringing your good works to Jesus, and he somehow supernaturally is turning it into a great work. And it's, it's an awesome thing to be involved in. So because of our position in Christ, we are positioned to do certain things, carry out certain tasks that can only be done by someone in that position. Minister the, ministering the love of Christ, operating the gifts of the Spirit, prophesying, calling out God's destiny in people's lives. It can happen just in a conversation over a cup of tea. And you say, you know, I just really sense that God is just showing me that there's a, you know, he, He's got a place to calling on your life and He wants you to rise to that calling and fulfill it. Do you know, sometimes that's the very thing that a person needs to hear just to get them moving in the things of God. And, and He's empowered us to do it. Isn't that awesome? 
Now, just to reiterate once again, you don't have to earn this position. This position in Christ is not something you gain after being a Christian for so many years and become like Pastor Sue. <laughs> I mean, when you look at Pastor Sue, you've got, well, obviously, she's dwelling in the heavenly realms. Look at her. Look at the fruit in her life, you know? Do you know, if you've confessed Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you're as much a citizen of heaven as Pastor Sue. You carry all the authority and everything I'm going to talk about in a moment just the same in the spiritual realm as she does because it was bestowed upon you. This citizenship, friends, has been bestowed upon us. Praise the Lord. Now, having this position of heavenly citizenship means that you carry certain spiritual rights and privileges. Remember I said before about the fact that I'm a New Zealand citizen? It actually gives me some, it, it, it's good, it puts me in good standing. It gives me some rights and privileges when I'm traveling. It means that if something goes wrong, I can appeal back to the New Zealand government. I can go to the New Zealand embassy and I can get action there. Stuff I'm taking care of. Why? Because I have rights as a New Zealand citizen. Now, as a citizen of heaven, you have rights. You have privileges that are yours because you're in Christ. And the first one that I want to, I've got four of them here. It's not an exhaustive list, but four that I really felt to, um, to highlight. Uh, let me do that now. The first one is that sin is no longer your master. If you are in Christ, sin is no longer your master. Now, you might be tempted to think, yeah, well, I really wish that was true because I kind of feel like, you know, sin's getting me. No, no, no. You need to understand, it doesn't matter how you feel, sin is not your master anymore. You can actually break free because sin is no longer your master. Romans 8 verse 1 to 2 says, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set me free from the law of sin and death. It happened when you confessed Christ as your Lord and Savior, friends. You were set free. Now, you might find that you still struggle with temptation to sin sometimes, and sometimes you even give in, but this doesn't mean that sin is your master. Don't let the enemy convince you that you're still bound by that stuff just because you stumble sometimes. Seriously, I, you know, we need to get this because sometimes we kind of feel like, oh, no, I did it again. Oh, I must be still under my sin. No, you're not. That hasn't changed anything. Just get up and run again. Have another go. Have another go. Don't, you know, I praise God for um, 1 John 1 verse 9, which says if we confess our sin, which is actually saying that we still have sin, if we confess our sin, he is faithful and just and will forgive us and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. He'll give you another shot get into it again. The blood of Jesus wasn't just for a one-shot wonder, and then, oh, well, you've stuffed it up again. That's it. You're, you're all over. No, no, no. The, the, the blood of Jesus goes on washing us. Keep applying it. Keep applying it. Is this, are you getting this this morning? And so, um, so at, at any point, at any point in your life, you can determine to break free and outgrow the temptations you now face. You don't have to stay there. See, years ago when I was a kid, I grew up out in the country and we had a little sort of two and a half acre, uh, acre little lifestyle property and we had chickens. Anybody else got chickens here? I know Kevin and Roz have. No roosters though. Hey, no, you're not allowed roosters in town, okay? Good thing because they just keep all the neighbors awake at four in the morning. But, uh, but we had chickens. We had roosters as well out in the country. And uh, when we needed more chickens, if we, if we needed to boost up our flock of chickens, we would go along to a, a, a chicken farm where they had battery hens. You know, we're, we're told to buy the eggs now from free-range chickens, aren't we? So that we try, you know, so that we, you know, that battery chicken farming will kind of be done away with because it's cruel. But back then, that was pretty much the go. And so what we used to do is we used to buy some of these uh, battery chickens that were past their best laying. So they might be two years old or something like that. And uh, we would bring them home, and we'd put them in the coop with our free-range chickens. I mean, our chickens were really free-range. I mean, you talk about having a chicken run and call that. No, 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 no. Our chickens had the rule of the whole place. And we just let them out every day, and they would just roam the paddock and kick them out of the garden and things. But um, anyway, so we used to get these battery chickens. We'd put them in the chicken house with the other chickens. The first thing they would do was hobble because they couldn't really walk. They'd only ever know in this little cage all their two years of life. They would hobble across the floor of the chicken house and hop into the, into the nesting boxes because that's all they knew. And they would sit in there. They'd sit in there for days, and they wouldn't get out. And, uh, but after a while, you know, we would try and coax them out. 
And after a while, they would. They would start to take some steps, and they would come out and walk on grass for the very first time in their lives. And I, I remember this distinctly, watching these chickens and their feet coming up off the ground because they'd never felt the soft green stuff before. And, and after a fairly short time, they were just running around the paddock and having a great time. They were living life. They were, they'd gotten saved. <laughs> they found Jesus. <laughs> Maybe I'm taking the illustration just a little far, but I think you get my point. You get my point. They were positioned. They were positioned for freedom. Now, when you confess Christ, it's like Jesus has taken you out of that battery hen farm. But the trouble is, so many of us, we wander back to the nesting box. What we know and what we feel comfortable with. And we think we're still bound. But you ain't. You're not bound anymore. You're free. So here's, here's the point. At any time, at any point in time you want, you can decide, you know what, that's it. That's it. I, I heard pastors say, I have, I'm positioned with Christ. I'm seated in heavenly places. I'm going after my freedom. And I'm not going to give up. And if I stumble and slip, around, slip and slide, at least I'm in a church that's not going to judge me for it. And I'm reinforcing that, that value, church, okay? We're not here to judge one another for the slippings and slidings that we have. We're here to walk with one another to freedom. Because... The person that judges is able to slip and slide just the same. And the Bible tells us, you know, the, the judgment that you judge others, you will also be judged. So oh, I'm not going down that track. <laughs> I just want to be there for people and help them. They trip over and fall in the mud, get up, wipe the mud out of your eyes and keep running up that hill. Keep going. You know, but you can do this. At any time, you can decide, I'm going to go free. Those chickens, it, all they had to do was, well, I'm going to go out with the other chickens, you know. And, uh, and, and gradually, that freedom begins to dawn and the reality of it, and it's a beautiful thing. Sin is no longer your master if you're seated with Christ. How do you get seated with Christ? You receive Christ into your life. Confess your sin. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I ask you to forgive me. I want to turn away from my old life. Help me to live for you. Come into my life, Jesus. I believe that you died on the cross and you rose again. Friend, that's how you enter the kingdom. It's an awesome thing. Number two, the second privilege you have is you have received the Holy Spirit of God. He's actually living inside of you, the Spirit of God Almighty. Luke 11 verse 13 says, If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give the Holy Spirit to those who ask Him? If you've asked, the whole, if you've asked Christ to come into your life, in other words, you've received, you've asked the Holy Spirit to come into your life, He's there. He's really inside of you. Romans 8 verse 11 says, And if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead is living in you, he who raised Christ from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies because of his spirit who lives in you. Friends, this, this is an amazing privilege. You didn't have this when you're outside of Christ. When you're not seated in heavenly places, you don't have the spirit to walk with you and to guide you. Now, that, does that mean that God doesn't love you? Absolutely, he loves you. Holy Spirit's probably drawing you, probably calling you, calling you, saying, come on, come over here, invite me in. I want to work from the inside, not just the outside. So you've received the Spirit. Now, this means that you have the Holy Spirit to guide you, to give you wisdom, to give you comfort, to give you strength, and to give you insight. You're not on your own in life. You're not an orphan. You, are, you have, a, you have a, a wonderful living Savior inside of you. I wonder how many of us take advantage of that fact. I wonder if, we, I wonder if we've got it all wrong in our heads and we think that, that we, we should be getting the Bible out, we should be praying because that's what you should do. Notice all the should, 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 shoulds. I love what Kent says, actually. Where are you, bro? There you are. Kent says, I don't do this because I have to, I do this because I get to. Hey, you remember saying that? That, that? just When I heard Kent say that, it went boom right into my spirit. And I thought, what a changed motivation for living the Christian life. I don't go to church because I have to. I go, to cause, go there because I get to. I don't get up in the morning and spend time reading the Word and praying because I have to, because I don't have to. Nowhere in the Scriptures does it say, confess the Lord Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and read the Bible twice a day and pray, and, and then you'll be saved. It doesn't say it. <laughs> so, so reading the Bible and praying is not going to get you any more saved than you already are if you've confessed Christ. But I'll tell you what it will do. It'll feed your spirit. It'll, it'll keep you saved. <laughs> you know, but not, but not out of a legalistic approach. 
out of a sense of, Lord, I get to do this. I, I want to nurture this walk with the Spirit. I want to read the Word. I want to listen for your voice. And I want to follow your voice. And I want to engage with you, Lord, especially when I'm going through one of those moments. You know, we all have those moments where we feel down and we feel like the world's against us and everything else. Well, right there, right there, there's a time to draw aside, to sit and I say to people, find a nice, comfortable chair, put the heater on if it's winter, make yourself a coffee because coffee and Jesus go together. (laughs) Amen, Rod. Hey, it's got that anointing on it, isn't it? Coffee. (laughs) <laughs> at Teamworks yesterday, uh, we were making coffee and, uh, so, and uh, someone made the comment, uh, oh, Rod came past because he does Streetwise Coffee and, and, uh, and it's like, wow, do you feel that anointing just go past? You know, sometimes <laughs> coffee and anointing is hard to tell the difference. <laughs> just joking, okay? Just joking. <laughs> but uh, what, what I'm saying is, find that place. Find that place where you can engage with the Holy Spirit. You'll find strength streaming into you. You'll find your mind starts to change the way you think about your situation. You'll find comfort coming. What I find is that when I, when I take time like this, when I'm feeling a bit confused, because believe it or not, I, I do have times like that. I feel confused. And I'm not sure what's going on, you know, especially with you lot. No, no, no. <laughs> and, <laughs> and sometimes, sometimes I just need something bigger than me to help me. And so I take a bit of time just to, just to engage with the Lord, whether it's prayer or whether it's in the Word, or go for a, a walk and start to walk. And I find suddenly my head starts to clear. And thoughts come beaming in that I, that, that, that just, wow, that was you, Lord. That's the Holy Spirit. And, he, and this is the privilege of people who are, who are seated in Christ in heavenly realms. Awesome, eh? I'm going to have to keep going or I'm not going to get finished in time. All right. Now, number three, the third privilege you have is that you now have access to heavenly resources such as provision, healing, and power. I call power and grace the same thing because I see the grace of God is also the power of God. And so you have, you have access to these things. Now, um, in Philippians 4 verse 19, it says, and my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So there's a promise right there. It's coming from the glorious, the, 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 his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Why? Because you're seated in heavenly places. Because you've confessed Christ. This is part of your position. God will supply all of your need. This is pretty awesome. And then we read in Mark chapter 16, verse 17 to 18, we read, And these signs will accompany those who believe. In my name they will drive out demons, they will speak in new tongues, they will pick up snakes with their hands, and when they drink deadly poison, it will not hurt them at all. They will place their hands on sick people, and they will get well. You go, man, that's incredible. So why aren't I walking in it? I'll tell you why. Because all of these things are about going. You don't sit around and just wait for God's provision to come. You get out there and serve His purposes, and you suddenly find you're walking into His provision. You see, you don't sit around and wait for God to provide you with $1,000 before you put a pledge into Project Katuk. It won't happen. And if it does, well, put it in anyway. <laughs> you see, the way it works, the way it works is you step into the provision of God by going. You, you, um, I, I love this thought. The word pro-vision... It's like two words, right? You've got the word pro and you've got the word vision. The word pro means for. If you are pro something, you're for something. Okay? The word pro vision is for vision. That's what it's about. So when you're pursuing vision, pro vision follows. Too often I think we are, we're not willing to step out in faith and we just want to sit around and wait till all our ducks are in a row before we head out there and, and, and serve God. This is one of the things I love about our interns and the team that's going to India. They don't have the cash. I ain't got it. They're giving you an opportunity to partner with them. But I'll tell you what, they're the ones trusting God. I've been there before. I've been there. We, we took a team of um, our interns up to um, Cambodia a number of years ago. And we needed to raise $15,000. I remember one particular day, everyone was moping around going, oh, it looks like it's not going to happen. You know? I said, right, no lecture today. We're just going for prayer. So we built ourselves up. We reminded ourselves, our God shall supply all of our needs. We got stuck into using the gift of tongues and breaking through. And I'll tell you what, we got there. After that prayer time, you'd think we already had the $15,000. We were so excited. See, because your spiritual state is not determined by circumstances. You need to understand this. 
You really need to understand this. Some of us are letting our circumstances dictate to us. You, your spiritual state dictates your circumstances. Um, when, when Walt Disney, I was, telling, I was talking about this with the interns during the week, but when Walt Disney, um, when, when Disney World was, was opened and about to, be, about, to, about to be opened, I should say, Walt Disney had died. And, uh, and, and at the opening, I think it was a news reporter said to his wife, oh, wouldn't Walt have loved to have seen this? She said he did see it. That's why it's here. It wouldn't have been here if he didn't see it. He, saw, he had a vision for this years ago. And he's been working toward this. He saw it all right. You see, vision and, and faith is actually what begets reality. Don't, don't sit around and let reality dictate to you your spiritual state. That's, that's not living in, in, in a position um, as a seated in Christ person. Are, are we getting this this morning? This is really, really important stuff. Okay. So... As you intentionally pursue the calling of God that God gives you, you will discover his provision and power. You won't be walking in it if you're not pursuing the kingdom purposes of God. Like I said before, putting a faith pledge in to Project Katuk or going on a short-term mission and trusting God for finances, these are steps. There's lots of others you could take as well, but these are steps that actually then you begin to claim your position in Christ. Lord, you said that you would, you would provide all of my needs according to your glorious riches in Christ. So I'm going, Lord. I'm trusting you. I'm going. Uh, intern team and, and, and India team, this, is, this is, needs to be your attitude. This needs to be your attitude from here out. If it hasn't already, this needs to be your attitude from here out. God, you will provide. You will provide. I'm trusting you. I'm trusting you. For anybody else, you're just living daily life. You're thinking, man, I want to live in a new zone. You start to live for the kingdom and watch what God does. Sometimes we've just limited ourselves because we're not really living for the kingdom. The kingdom's taking second rate. Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God in Matthew 6, Then all these things will be added to you. The provision that you need will follow. That's how the principle works. Hey, here's the final one. You've been bestowed with spiritual authority. Part of your position in Christ, you have been bestowed with spiritual authority. Matthew 28, verse 18 and 19 says this. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me, therefore go. You say, oh, well, it's saying that Jesus had all the authority. No, no, he's commanding you and I to go in his authority so that his authority can flow through you. But did you notice those words, therefore go? You, start, you want to walk in the authority of Jesus. It's about going. It's about serving the kingdom. I want to say to Teamworks guys, every time you're going out to do Teamworks on a Saturday morning, you're going in the authority of the Lord. You can expect the provisions and the blessing of God upon your life as you serve and as you go. People in our worship team, all the various things that people do in life, it's kingdom service. So start to claim the position in Christ that comes as, a, as one who serves the, in the kingdom. Luke 10 verse 19 says, I have given you authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. Well, I haven't seen too many scorpions and serpents in my country. They're mostly in other countries. It means I've got to go to experience that one. Actually, in Cambodia, you don't just get to uh, trample upon serpents and scorpions. You get to eat them. <laughs> We've got pictures of, of uh, deep fried scorpions uh, from our last trip. It's pretty awesome. I didn't actually eat one, but um, maybe I will next time, just to prove it. <laughs> hey, the authority that Jesus has given us is realized in our going and in our pursuing of his calling. Mark 11 verse 23 tells us, well, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself into the sea and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Friends, I want to tell you something. You have authoritative power to speak to the mountains of resistance that stand between you and the vision that God has given you, and you can command them to move. I haven't seen too many actual natural mountains that actually need to be cast into the sea. I think Jesus was painting for us a picture here of how to live as one who is seated in heavenly places. Start to speak. He didn't say, ask the Lord to remove the mountain. He said, you speak to it because you've been given authority. You might say, oh, yeah, but that's all right for Pastor Sue. <laughs> Sorry, Pastor Sue. Because, you know, she's obviously got plenty of authority. She's the associate pastor of the church. Different type of authority. Different field of authority. We're talking about, we're talking about uh, church leadership and church structure authority there. 
I have authority invested in me as a senior pastor to chart vision and, and, and to preach like this. That's not the spiritual authority we're talking about here. Every single one of us have authority over the enemy. Every single one of us have authority over fear and over doubt and over mountains of resistance. It's not like Pastor Sue or Pastor Russell got any more authority than you've got. We've all got the same authority in that regard. So let's rise in it. Let's rise in it. And here's the challenge for this morning. Two challenges. Are you actively taking up your position in Christ? If you've been given a position in a sports team, you've got to actively play that position, right? You don't, you don't, um, you're not on the sports field to pick daisies or chase butterflies like Napoleon Dynamite, if you've seen the movie. He's out there on the baseball field and he's, you know, Napoleon and he's running after butterflies. That's not your role. You're not called to do that. You're called to take up the position. So taking up your position in Christ means living for God's kingdom, seeking first the kingdom of God. You're not on this earth to simply build a career or save for your retirement. You're here to build God's kingdom. I'm not saying you shouldn't build a career. I'm not saying you shouldn't save for retirement. I'm just saying they come second. If you do those things and not seek the kingdom of God, you got it wrong. Do those things, but seek the kingdom first. I remember hearing of an elderly gentleman lived over in Fielding on his 70th birthday. Uh, someone said his name was Pop White. And someone said to him, hey, Pop, are you going to retire now? You're 70? He says, retire? He said, that's for old people. <laughs> he says, no, 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 I want to go to Papua New Guinea as a missionary. You know, send me there. And that's what he did for 17 years. Came back at 87. Who said you can't serve God in your latter years? You know, Caleb said, Caleb said, hey, I'm, I'm now 80 years old. You know, I'm just as strong today for going out and coming as I, was, as I was when I was 40 years old. So now give me this mountain. Some of us, I think, and I, I, so I want to I um, encourage our older folks now. I want to encourage the 60 plus people that God has positioned you. You are positioned. I, I, in fact, I prophesied over a couple in our church this morning in the earlier service, a, a, a couple in their 60s. And I said to the Lord, the Lord's just shown me that, that your greatest days are ahead of you. They really are. You're positioned for greatness. And so I want to encourage our 60 plus people. Your best days are ahead of you because of your position in Christ. Take a hold of it and run with it. Say, God, I'm here to serve your purposes. I'm here to run. Kevin and Roz, your best days are ahead of you. Your best days are ahead of you with new knees, Roz. Hey, (laughs) praise the Lord. That's right, from heaven. (laughs) Seriously. Let's empower one another. Let's empower one another. The second challenge this morning, so the first one was, are you actively taking up your position in Christ? The second thing here is, are you choosing to see yourself as an above-the-line Christian rather than a below-the-line Christian? That's um, harping back to a message we had a few weeks ago on DVD by Pastor Joel Holm. Above-the-line Christians determined to see life with a victory perspective. They pray differently to below-the-line Christians. The prayers of below-the-line Christians are determined by their problems. Lord, solve this problem. Fix that up. Do this. Provide that. Make that happen. Change that person's mind. You know, it's all dictated by problems, whereas the prayers of above-the-line Christians are determined by kingdom purposes. So it's rather than, rather than Lord, would you help me pay the rent? It's rather, Lord, would you, would you help me release into the kingdom? Would you provide for me so that I can release into the kingdom, God? Do you know the rent gets paid when that happens? And that's not the issue. The issue is your kingdom, Lord. That's above the line mentality. Challenging, eh? Who's blessed by this this morning? Father, we just thank you, Lord God, for your word. We pray, Lord God, that it would just begin to settle in our hearts and produce good fruit. Lord, I pray that it wouldn't just kind of disappear from our minds, but you'd stir us up, Lord God, because we have a position in Christ. We're called to fulfill that position. We're called, Lord God, to live it out. Father God, and we're called to walk in all of the power of it. What an exciting life it becomes, Lord God, when we're walking in the provision. We're walking in the authority of our position in Christ. Lord, we're walking in the fulfillment of the calling of God. What an amazing thing. And that is here for every single one of us, Lord. Father, I just release this uh, message over this congregation today in the name of Jesus.